Good morning. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in today. I know many are beginning their holiday festivities today on Christmas Eve. So Dr. Levine and I will be somewhat brief, but we thought it was important to keep to our twice weekly schedule, make sure we update for monitors on the latest number of cases and the vaccine rollout before heading into a holiday weekend for many. Before getting into those updates, I want to continue highlighting acts of kindness, service, and goodwill uh, happening throughout Vermont. So let me talk a little bit about the Mary Hogan School in Middlebury. After hearing about our Vermont Lights the Way and Rays of Kindness initiative, the students and staff were inspired and wanted to help brighten spirits during the holiday season. Uh, the school's pre-K to sixth grade students, as well as staff, uh, wanted to do their part. Uh, so they got creative, making art projects with inspiring messages of hope. They worked uh, with the Better Middlebury Partnership to connect with local businesses. And now on the storefront windows and doors throughout the community, you can find these messages from students. They even made a, a video uh, to highlight their work, so now I'd like to show you uh, what they've been up to. This is uh, exactly what Vermont Lights the Way is all about, encouraging people to get creative in their communities and add a little happiness as we close out this very, very difficult year. So I want to thank all the students and staff at the school, as well as the small businesses and their partners for helping to make this happen. You set an example for all, all of us. Now, not all of these acts of kindness are as visible but they are meaningful. For instance, I recently learned about a Vermonter who saw their neighbor bringing home five gallons of fuel every couple of days to heat her home. She obviously couldn't afford a bulk delivery, so this neighbor anonymously uh, sent her 100 gallons of fuel, and she may never know uh, who it was. A neighbors helping neighbors is what Vermont is all about. Every day I hear or see stories like these, and it gives me hope. And it's why I've been so confident through these nine long months that we will get through this. And in the end, we'll be stronger for it. I hope these stories inspire you as well, because this world we live in could certainly use more acts of kindness in order to give us hope and hope for others as well. I know it's been hard. I know the sacrifices needed to stay safe are difficult, especially during the holidays. 
but Vermont is strong and we're united and we'll get through this as long as we stick together. I want to wish all of those who celebrate a happy and safe Christmas. Please enjoy this time and do so safely and know we'll be back together in person in the months ahead. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Veen for an update on vaccines and some parting guidance for the holiday. Thank you. <clears throat> so in terms of some data, today we're reporting 92 new cases and unfortunately three additional deaths. As a physician, I'm acutely aware of the fact that the holidays do not always bring good tidings to all, and our sympathies do go out to all of the families and friends. There are currently 22 patients hospitalized, with six in the ICU. Our epidemiology teams are following 43 active outbreaks and 250 situations. Based on our testing results, the state's seven-day positivity rate remains low at around 2.1%. Over the past 10 months, wow, 10 months, I've been up here reporting numbers of people testing positive for COVID, numbers in the hospital, lives lost. We're nearing the end of what has been an exceedingly tough year. I know we're all weary, our daily lives are strained, and we're having difficulty finding joy in the season as the nights grow long. I do hope Vermonters take some solace in knowing Vermont still enjoys the lowest number of new cases rate, the lowest positivity rate, and death rate in the, continent, <coughs> in the continental US. What has given me hope throughout this year is the effort by Vermonters to take in and take to heart the nature of what we have been facing and everything we each need to do to end this pandemic. And it's been truly inspiring. I ask you to keep it up and keep in mind masks on faces, six foot spaces, uncrowded places. It's that simple. And with vaccine coming our way, there's even more hope to end this pandemic. Yesterday, Vermont received 11,400 doses of the newly authorized Moderna vaccine. With the anticipated allocation of Pfizer, we're on track to have received 34,000 doses by New Year's. The total Vermont allocation in weeks one and two of Pfizer and Moderna has been 21,725 doses. There have been 6,382 COVID vaccine doses administered to Vermont residents. If you do the math, that's approximately 30%. I'll point out that nationwide, it's about 10% out of the 10 million doses that have been allocated to states thus far. And as promised, yesterday we did launch our Vermont vaccine dashboard. You'll find it at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 dash, <coughs> dash vaccine dash data. The dashboard shows the number of people who've been vaccinated and the total number of doses administered. As the numbers grow, you'll be able to see vaccination rates by sex, age, ethnicity, race, and county. And the dashboard will continue to undergo enhancements as more information becomes available. For now, in part because we're in the early stages of vaccine distribution, the dashboard will be updated every Wednesday by noon. But I anticipate over the coming weeks we'll be able to provide more frequent updates. I want to thank our immunization and data teams for their excellent and rapid work in continuing to provide this level of information to Vermonters. As we discussed on Tuesday, immunizations have already been initiated at long-term care facilities, along with health care workers and others in the Phase 1A group who also continue to be vaccinated. Earlier this week, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices made recommendations 
for populations to be included in phase 1B. Yesterday, our own vaccine implementation advisory group met to consider these recommendations to help in finalizing Vermont's plan for phase 1B. We expect their final recommendations in one week. We are now solidly on the road to protecting Vermonters and Americans. Please remember, though, that we have only just started on what is a long road. My message for everyone is be patient. This is going to take some time. The time is obviously related to the production rate and distribution of the vaccine from the manufacturers and the number of vaccine platforms that get early use authorization in the coming year. There are nearly 630,000 people in Vermont and a very large number of people to be vaccinated just in priority group 1A with another large number expected in group 1B. It's a huge and logistically complex undertaking, perhaps the most complicated nationwide never mind statewide immunization effort since the early 20th century. Nonetheless, we will vaccinate Vermont as fast as possible. We're receiving shipments weekly in shares allocated, allocated to Vermont in a population proportion basis from the pool that Pfizer and Moderna produce for the country. This effort will be based on a comprehensive approach to fairly and equitably ensure that everyone who can be vaccinated and wishes to be vaccinated has that opportunity. But again, this will take time. And for those of you who are in generally good health and not in one of the first phases, it may be several months before you receive your vaccine. But even for those of us who must be patient, Every dose being given out right now makes a difference for all of us. For every Vermonter who is vaccinated benefits us all. The amount of virus that's circulating is a factor in our risk of exposure. And slowly, as more vaccine arrives in Vermont and as more people are vaccinated, the risk within our own borders will grow smaller and smaller. It'll take time, but it has started. In the meantime, your patience and cooperation are critical to an effective process. You'll learn when vaccine is available to you and where and when to get it. Please don't call or reach out to hospitals about when it will be available. Hundreds of people are working to make this information process happen. To put it simply, hang tight, vaccine is coming. I'll finish with what may sound like a bit of gloom, but is actually rooted in the optimism I feel as the days start getting longer and vaccine becomes more plentiful. As I said on Tuesday, the daily number of new COVID cases in Vermont continues to be higher than just a couple of months ago. In fact, we haven't reported fewer than 50 cases since November 27th. But the numbers, though they fluctuate, are stabilizing. But daily reports of cases in the high double digits is still not good news, and I don't want any of us to consider this to be the new normal that we should expect every day. Each and every case are real people, nearly 7,000 now, people with families, people with stories of their lives, and the loved ones of 120 of them are now people represented by empty seats at the table. I say this in the spirit of reminding myself and all of us to keep that in mind as we work together to get this virus under control. To remember the toll it takes on anyone who gets it, whether they have minor symptoms or find themselves in an ICU, and the responsibility we have to each other to prevent its spread. While it's been a tough year, and many of us will still miss one another this holiday season, with smaller celebrations that just won't be the same. So as we take time to celebrate the steadily increasing light, being together in ways that are different, and perhaps not as we would hope, please stay informed to stay well and stick closely to the guidance. This really does have an end point, one in which we can have hope that many more people together around the table will surround us in the year to come. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. And we'll now open it up to questions. All right, folks, as discussed,
us. Uh, we're hoping to get everybody out of here as early as possible to start their ho a holiday. Uh, so we're going to have everybody just take one question. If you have a second question, please reach out to Ethan and we'll circle back if there's time. We'll start with Calvin. Uh, thank you, Governor. So, Dr. Levine, you mentioned that um, so far, out, out of all the vaccines that we've received, we've only uh, administered some 6,000 or a little over 6,000 so far. I'm wondering, I guess, why it, why we haven't administered more, I suppose? I mean, is, is there something that, that's holding us back in terms of like, staffing or people that can administer them? I guess, why, why not faster, why not more? So the process of administering it is on two levels. One is at the healthcare, for the healthcare workers, which involves the hospitals at this point in time, making sure they arrange clinics, making sure that they schedule their employees for those clinics. They can't just schedule all the employees from one section at one time, because if they get side effects and have to miss a day or two of work, uh, they can't do that to their workforce. Um, and the complex work of all of the people not employed by the hospital, but who are still healthcare workers in their regions, which includes uh, practices, independent practices, primary care, OBGYN, includes EMS, et cetera. Um, the long-term care facilities are in the Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program, which also has um, clinics scheduled, the first ones which, which just occurred on Monday, and Vermont was in the first 10 states to actually even uh, use that vaccine for that purpose. Uh, so ahead of, ahead of the game there as well. Um, they are doing it on a nursing home by nursing home basis, obviously. While they want to get all of the residents, we've learned that they still have some challenges in getting the consent for all of those residents since many of the consents need to come from family members. Um, and they, the nursing homes have been working with the family members but haven't achieved that universally yet. Like the hospitals, they also can't vaccinate every employee at a nursing home at the same time because of the fact that they could get ill again and they're already challenged with staffing issues. But I do want to stress the fact that, you know, we're, we're actually three times the rate of use of this vaccine than the national numbers show at this point. So I'd like it to be looked at as good news, but the fact is all of this will be deployed. None of this has gone to waste. It's not that people didn't freeze it properly and it couldn't use it. It's just a matter of all of the systems they're putting in play to try to make sure that they can get all the employees and residents of the nursing homes, et cetera, vaccinated. Thank you. As well, Calvin, it's part of my nature, uh, but uh, we'll get better at this as well. I mean, this is just the first week, and uh, we'll uh, we'll continue to strive uh, to become more uh, efficient, uh, try and get more productive. And uh, thus far, we've done done well. And there is some lag time between when we receive uh, the the vaccine and when we can actually get it uh, to those who can administer it. So, uh, but I think you'll see some improvement as time moves on. Um, question for Governor Scott. How do you plan to spend the holiday? Are you planning to take advantage of your new guidance that families can gather with one other household? No, um, it'll just be my wife and I. Uh, my mom was, uh, was planning. Uh, this was back during the summer. She lives in Florida and was planning to come up. She hasn't been to Vermont in decades, and this was going to be the year she was coming. But, uh, but after we saw the... Uh, the increased numbers in September, October, she made the tough decision not to come. Um, my daughter, I have another daughter who lives in um, Providence, and uh, they're under, uh, you know, the same type of conditions we are, so she's not coming either. So it'll just be a very low-key, low-key Christmas uh, day for us. Thank you. Jolie? Dr. Levine, um, when the vaccine becomes more widely distributed, um, will there be such things as pop-up vaccine sites? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we've all been talking as a team about when the vaccine is more available and as these larger priority groups come into play. 
uh, how to effectively and efficiently and equitably get the vaccine to everyone. So there will be a multi-pronged approach. There will be some things that you would consider traditional, like going to your own physician, their office to get vaccine. We think that will be especially taken advantage of by those who are older and have more chronic diseases who see their physicians very frequently and will want to discuss the vaccine with them and probably have it administered at that office. We also have a great tradition of uh, pharmacies playing a great role, and uh, I can't believe pharmacies won't continue to play a role. They're playing the role at the long-term cares now, but they're bringing the vaccine to that population. This will be in the pharmacy for the public. There's also a, uh, what we call a pod system, a point of distribution system that involves our district health offices and they've always been very steady partners in the vaccine distribution process and administration process as well. And then superimposed on that, uh, what we're in the planning stages on and discussing very actively is having sites that one could have more, we'll call it mass vaccination events. So very similar to what goes on in testing, whether that be at one of our new uh, expanded test sites, whether that be at a place like the Champlain Exposition, et cetera, where uh, you could get a very large number of people uh, administered vaccine very quickly. Have to build in all of the appropriate you know, precautions and safeguards, et cetera, because uh, no matter where you administer the vaccine, there are rules about a 15-minute observation period, 30 minutes if you've had any prior reactions, et cetera. So we have to take all that into account. But, there's a tremendous amount of planning going on with regard to all of those. And we've learned a little from the flu vaccine this year where we've achieved record you know, numbers so far um, because our medical community has joined with us and partnered with us in being creative about other ways to get vaccine to people as opposed to people to the vaccine. And I think we have to be very thoughtful about that with the mass vaccine uh, issue I just provided, but other ways as well to uh, get the vaccine where people are so uh, we can effectively get it to them and not make it a challenge for them. Thank you. Can we use the phone? We'll start with Aaron VT Digger. Aaron? VT Digger? Okay, we'll move to Wilson, the AP. Um, hi, everybody. Happy holidays to everyone. Um, Dr. Levine, I'm kind of curious what you said a couple of minutes ago. I look back to my notes, but I'm curious. Were you telling people they should not call their doctor's office or, or wherever to say, when can I get vaccinated? And if that's the case, how should it be? Would doctors often then reach out to their list of patients and say, oh, it's time for patient X to be vaccinated? And if, if that is the case, what would, uh, how would people be vaccinated who don't have regular health care providers? All, all excellent questions. And I am saying, as of December 24th, don't call your doctor's office, don't call your hospital, don't call the health department because for the majority of people, vaccination is not in their immediate future. <clears throat> you know, we anticipate getting through priority group 1A uh, through the month of January, and then whatever priority group 1B looks like, which will almost certainly have an age stratification to it um, from the older ages down, uh, that will take some time to uh, till it becomes real in terms of the number of doses coming into the state and having already gotten through 1A. So um, lots of people are feeling the need to reserve a spot uh, on a list that, and the list doesn't exist uh, for most of the practices they're calling or the hospitals or for the state for that matter. But it will be very clear uh, when the prioritization scheme comes out uh, exactly who goes when, and that will be very publicly available information. It'll be communicated through a whole host of 
conventional as well as social media. It will also be uh, effectively known by the healthcare community at that time, so they'll be able to participate in that communication and scheduling as well. So I'm saying it as of December 24th, just because so many people are already uh, nervous about the fact they need to be on a list or they may be at the end of the line, which is certainly not true, uh, or, or just feeling like they need to make that connection. Uh, it won't change anything for them to do that right now. Okay, so then at the end of, of, of when list 1B is finalized, somebody who is over age 75, which presumably they would be in 1B, they would then be able to uh, call their doctor's office to make an appointment? Yes, so there'll be a lot of instructions be, that we'll be able to provide at that point in time because as you heard from my answer to the other question, there will be multiple opportunities for them to get vaccine, one of which will be with their doctor if that's the, the path where they choose. Um, and that's where they'll work with their own healthcare providers to uh, understand that. I just had a conversation with um, one of the primary care practices uh, in the state um, who are worried because they may get Pfizer, and Pfizer, of course, has very strict temperature regulations around the vaccine, but they're already exploring opportunities for them to do that at a more central location. So it wouldn't necessarily be at the practice, but at a more central location where people from other practices will all join them in getting the vaccine. So there's a lot of planning going on at very many levels, from the state down to the individual healthcare systems and practices themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, and I believe Aaron, did you want to go? Hey, I was just going to add uh, as well to what Dr. Levine had said, some of the complexities that we're facing at this point in time with the Pfizer vaccine in particular, um, sub-zero temperature storage. Uh, the Moderna is not uh, is refrigerated, but not at the same temperatures as the, uh, the the Pfizer. And then we're hearing that possibly in the future, if the Johnson and Johnson comes through, that might even be at room temperature. So, uh, in single doses. So it's just all kinds of different uh, procedures in place that we have to contemplate, and who gets what when, in order to make sure that we get the distribution uh, in an expeditious way. All right, we're going to try Aaron from VT Digger again. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for swinging back around. Um, this week, the Agency of Education issued a memo rescinding their earlier guidance about schools, including a question about multi household gatherings in the daily health check. Obviously, the governor has relaxed this prohibition on multi-household socialization for the holidays, but this guidance doesn't appear to suspend the question or amend it. It says schools may no longer include this question at all in the daily check. Can you tell us the thinking behind that? Uh, Secretary French, are you on? Yes, I am. Good morning, Governor. Uh, yeah, our thinking on that was, you know, we looked um, you know, certainly at, at the condition of our, the virus in our community. Um, and listening to our school districts, this was a very challenging uh, piece of guidance for them to implement, arguably probably the most challenging thing we've asked them to do. Um, and as, you know, at the time when we implemented this part of Thanksgiving, we weren't really sure or confident in the trajectory of our case count in the state. And at that level off, uh, we felt comfortable saying this, this uh, guidance was no longer necessary that quickly. So uh, that's why we rescinded it. Did you, uh, did you consider having schools ask if students had been in a triple household or more gathering? You know, once again, this, this has been a very complex piece of guidance to implement, and uh, it was challenging enough with some of the uh, nuance that we had imparted previously. Uh, so, you know, really where we're headed, particularly um, as the case counts have leveled off, as Dr. Lee said, arguably at a high level that we're not satisfied with, but still leveling off. Um, particularly with guidance, we'd like to be, head more towards simplicity, not more complexity. And I think there was enough complexity in the guidance previously. Um, so that's why you know, we're sending it seems to be the better approach. Okay, thank you. As, as well, Aaron, if you recall uh, about a month ago when we put this into place um, and took these steps, 
uh, to try and protect Vermonters. We were seeing in our contact tracing in particular um, that there were multi-household gatherings happening, uh, whether it be parties or get-togethers with family and so forth, or tailgate parties and, so, and, and, and the like. Um, what we're finding now, since we implemented that, uh, that Vermonters uh, understand uh, and got the message. And so with our contact tracing, we're just not seeing uh, the gathering that we saw previous uh, to this, uh, the restrictions being put into place. So it's somewhat um, unnecessary. The guidance uh, speaks for itself, and, uh, and I think Vermonters have gotten the message. All right, Liam. Um, Liam, VPR. Hi, um, President Trump has been sort of floating and threatening the idea that he's going to reject the aid package that Congress approved earlier this week. Um, Governor, what's your reaction to sort of the state of things right now in Washington? Yeah, you know, that's really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many, as I've highlighted over the last few weeks, uh, and particularly uh, many of the programs that are ending by the end of the year that are going to put Vermonters and Americans at risk. And uh, this is a dangerous game. Uh, the president is playing, and um, it's it's you know would have been my hope that if he had concerns about what he wanted to see in the package, that he would have been at the table long before now and not just sit uh, idly by watching uh, the action taking place, uh, the, them passing, coming to agreement, a bipartisan agreement on the package, and not everybody got what they wanted, but uh, they were satisfied that. Uh, that this was what was best at this point in time uh, for the American people. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what he's going to do. He has a, a few choices, uh, one being just to veto it. Uh, but, uh, but you know, when you negotiate uh, a, a piece of legislation, it means everyone's giving up something. And so to take pieces out of it uh, could unravel everything. And uh, that would be unfortunate, but I hope Congress uh, will again uh, stick to their votes and uh, and see this through uh, so that we can get relief uh, to those in desperate need. I mean, there's obviously only so much that, that um, you can do with the state can do, but are you uh, contemplating any sort of contingency plans or, or action to, to try to help the thousands of Vermonters who might be now again looking at losing unemployment benefits the day after Christmas? Yeah, you know, the problem, as I, as I um, articulated before, is that when you have so many, there could be upwards to 10 to 20,000 uh, Vermonters that would lose their unemployment benefits almost immediately. And when you do the math, uh, that's uh, many, many millions of dollars that we don't have at our disposal. So uh, we'll, uh, I'm, I'm still hopeful. I, I believe that Congress will do the right thing. Uh, and. Uh, work their way through this, uh, but uh, until the until the president uh, gets over his tantrum, uh, we'll have to see what happens. Have you sent any, any letters, any pressure with other Republican governors to, to the president at this time? I'm, I'm not sure that he would be listening to anyone else at this point, um, and I will have to leave it to Congress to try and work out their way through this. All right, we're going to move. Thank you. Mike at the Islander. Thanks for back up. Uh, Merry Christmas, Governor. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Levine, you uh, mentioned uh, 43 outbreaks. Uh, what are the top five currently on your list? And uh, could you uh, please get your staff to uh, maybe send out the full list of places and number of cases? currently uh, among those 43 outbreaks? Yeah, I, I would want to say that you can't define the importance of an outbreak by a specific criteria, whether it be uh, where it is or what the number associated with it is. So, it, it, you know, it's hard to have a top five or a top ten list, if you will. Um, these are all defined from an epidemiologic standpoint about the number of cases that are involved in the setting that it's involved in and the kinds of epidemiologic linkages that are occurring. I can tell you that 
Um, we have abundant um, numbers of cases in our long-term care facilities, as you know. So those are obviously a very high concern because of the fact that when people get sick in those settings, they often culminate in hospitalizations and or death. So by that metric alone, that's really important. There are other aspects of our healthcare system that have cases, but not necessarily outbreaks. There are small worksite outbreaks that are self-limited and uh, containable, but they nonetheless um, may be an outbreak. There are situations that have occurred um, across society. So it would be hard for me to, to really give you the kind of answer you're looking for because they're all important. And our knowledge about them is as important as anything else so that we can immediately work with all of them to make sure that containment is the ultimate result. And that's really the, the bottom line, if you will. Um, knowing about them, making sure everyone who needs to isolate is isolated, making sure all the contacts have been contacted, and making sure that they are quarantined. And in most cases, and hopefully, allowing the rest of uh, life to go on for others who may uh, be at the same work site or what have you. Um, but that's really the ultimate goal is containment and identifying them rapidly so we can uh, move on things quickly and keep our ultimate case loads low and our ultimate number of people who get ill low. Okay, thank you. I, I just, maybe just, can you send the list over and we'll take a look at it and not to ask you to analyze the numbers by number order, but what you've done in the past is shared the list. And can we get today's list currently? Yeah, we, yeah, we will share what we are able to share based on uh, uh, the usual considerations with numbers, et cetera. Thank you. All right, Lisa, the Valley Reporter. This question is also for Dr. Levine. Dr. Levine, the New York Times reports this morning that Dr. Fauci has been gradually inching up the number of people who we need to have been get vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity, with um, the number rising from 60 to 70 percent to now as high as 90 percent. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I'm sure the governor wishes to join me in uh, congratulating and uh, offering our best to Dr. Fauci, whose 80th birthday is today. Um, so he's actually given a range, and his range is 70 to 90 percent, because even he admits we really don't know, um, because we're dealing with a novel virus and um, we're not actually sure of what number will achieve community or herd immunity, but he estimates it's in the 70 to 90 percent range. And the issue here is really not what the exact number is, is uh, are there enough Americans who now have trust in vaccines, who are not hesitant to receive vaccine, and who want to help not only protect themselves, but others in their family and in their circles um, by getting vaccinated. And the numbers look promising in that regard with regard to surveys of uh, people asking them if they would take the vaccine or not. And having people like Dr. Fauci uh, appear on camera getting the vaccine uh, should help that effort, I would hope. But we do know that there's perhaps up to 20% of people that might not want to get the vaccine. And if that's true, uh, we hope that the number that is needed for herd immunity is 80% or less, because that's what it will require. But as I've said before, it's not just the number who get the vaccine, it's also the number who continue to abide by all of the usual guidance uh, that helps prevent us transmit virus from one person to another because our ultimate goal is to suppress this virus to a sufficient level knowing we can never make it disappear and vanish off the planet but suppress it to a level that will allow us to get back to the kind of lives we all want to lead again. So that, that's my answer to your question. Thank you very much. Guy Page.
Guy? Um, yes, uh, Governor and, and the Commissioner, um, I, as you look back on these unprecedented 10 months and you analyze your leadership in fighting the pandemic, is there anything you would have done differently? Um, looking back. Yeah, from my perspective, uh, Guy, um, maybe a little too early to look back too much. We're still looking forward. Um, but um, we'll, we'll certainly uh, take all of that into account uh, so that we're ready if and when there's some other uh, crisis of this magnitude in the future. But, um, but at this point in time, um, we're just doing everything we think is right. Um, we know that uh, uh, there are times when we don't make the right decisions, uh, but we're learning from others and others are learning from us. And we as a country are trying to do whatever we can to protect Americans. And uh, I think we've done a, a pretty good job here in Vermont, but it's due to Vermonters just being compliant, following the guidelines, the simple procedures. So um, if, um, if we'll let the pundits uh, decide what we could have done better, uh, but at this point, I'm, I'm satisfied uh, with what we've done. Uh, but, uh, but again, we know uh, that we could have, there are always ways to do things better in retrospect. Dr. Levine. Yeah, I, I just echo what the governor said. Um, certainly, most of the uh, evaluations we get from the outside um, are, are not harshly critical of the approach, but at the same time, we recognize that there are 50 states plus a number of territories, and all of them have their own version of what they're doing to combat this pandemic. Some are kind of uh, in lockstep with the approach we've taken. Many others are very different than the approach we've taken. So part of that evaluation will be in the end, when people look back, uh, comparing the relative performances of states uh, and uh, what they may have done to either achieve that great performance or achieve a poor performance either way and what they could have done to, to, to be better. I think uh, if there's one thing we do, we approach every day with humility. And we certainly, as the governor said, we're willing to learn from anybody because um, we don't know everything either. And when this pandemic started, we were all writing the playbook. Even though there was a pandemic flu playbook from 2017 that was fairly focused on influenza, uh, it provided a little bit of help to the country, but there was not much else to go on uh, except good public health practice and knowledge and how to implement programs across large populations. So we've tried to do our best in that regard. And even thinking about Calvin's first question today about, you know, what, what accounts for how we've gotten to the number of people vaccinated or not, you have to realize that it's only two weeks ago that that vaccine appeared to any state. And at that time, not only did the vaccine uh, logistics have to be taken care of in terms of getting it to the right places at the right time, but there were all the issues about what do we know about this vaccine? How do we educate people about it quickly? And the people, not just meaning the people getting it, but the people administering it, the healthcare community. Uh, and all of those playbooks were literally being written in a 72 hour period. So we've come this far in two weeks and some people will say, well, only 30% and others will say, wow, that's pretty impressive considering there was no vaccine on the planet three, two weeks ago and nobody knew what to do with it and understood it. Uh, so it's that kind of process. I'll stop there. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. No questions. I just hope you have a great holiday. Thank you, Chris. All right, Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I've been looking at the news feed and there's no news from the president, but presumably if he does sign a current bill as passed, with that, uh, it was unclear to me when uh, the Congressman Walsh was with you the other day on whether it would be retroactively to the current year, the current act, uh, CARES Act or the current uh, UI Trust Fund, uh, if it would apply to that or whether it's only going forward in 2021. 
Yeah, as currently written, I, I believe that is the case, that it would go back uh, to uh, this, this calendar year, to this month. Uh, but I might ask Commissioner Harrington if he has any different information than that. Yeah, I might ask, uh, could you just repeat the question? I don't think I caught the whole thing. It, it was about, uh, Commissioner, it was about whether this, uh, this new package uh, that was passed by Congress, uh, whether it be retroactive back to the end date. Uh, you know, there's been one, at least one program, I believe, that has ended uh, at this point in time a week ago. Uh, is, is it retroactive to that date, or is it starting uh, whenever it's uh, in effect? Um, thank you, Governor. Uh, my understanding and based on feedback we've received early from the U.S. Department of Labor is that based on their initial interpretation of the language in the bill, it would start the, the first full week following the um, approval or authorization of the bill. So you can't go back uh, in time, but if you were in a program uh, that got an extension, you could still be eligible for those 11 weeks. Um, it just wouldn't be 11 weeks back from the date you um, maybe triggered off of your benefits. It would be 11 weeks from uh, the start or, or the authorization of the bill. So not that back into December, sense. possibly into January. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah, correct. There is a, a provision in the bill that says um, the week will commence following um, the authorization of the bill. So uh, just to be clear, Michael, it sounds like uh, people might still, even if it gets passed, they still might lose a full week of benefits. So they may be a break in their benefits. But it's hard to, I don't want to say lose a week because, um, again, the extension really talks about the maximum number of weeks uh, an individual can receive. Um, so they could still receive uh, the um, maximum number of weeks, but it would be counted going forward. So they would have to remain unemployed um, for the next 11 weeks following the passing of the bill, as opposed to counting maybe um, a few weeks uh, prior to the bill uh, authorization. So again, they, there's still that, um, that understanding that they could receive the maximum number of weeks. It just wouldn't go backwards. Okay. All right, thank you. And we'll try and clarify that uh, for you, Tim, and others as we uh, receive more information. Greg, the County Courier. Good morning, Governor. Uh, given the kind of time constraints today, I'm just going to wish you a Merry Christmas, your staff, and the Vermonters who have worked really hard to keep this state going over the last 10 months. So I'll hold off. Hopefully, ask an extra question on Tuesday, but Merry Christmas. All right. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas to you as well. Tom, Vermont Standard. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Okay, we'll go to Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, wondering if there's any additional information on the outbreak at the Craftsbury Community Care Center beyond just the baseline number that was reported on the data site. Uh, and it makes me wonder, if there is an outbreak in a facility like this, are you able to, to do vaccinations when um, when folks may be, uh, have already been exposed and, and are waiting for onset of symptoms. Dr. Levine. Yeah, so I don't have a specific update on what you mentioned, but in answer to your question, um, there are guidelines that have been put out by the CDC regarding vaccination in settings where there are outbreaks. Um, and we're using that guidance actually uh, as we start with the long-term care facilities because obviously a number of them do have outbreaks that uh, are of concern. Um, I want people to understand that vaccination at that time in that setting is not necessarily a strategy um, because it, it does not it takes enough time for that to uh, build up antibodies, et cetera, 
that most of the people who would have been exposed to the virus have already been exposed, that even if they aren't testing positive, they may subsequently test positive. Uh, they're incubating, if you will. Uh, but there are guidelines that allow you to do vaccinations at those times. The time that you more frequently are going to be delaying vaccination have to do with someone who has already tested positive and been ill. Uh, we want those people vaccinated, but probably not at that point in time, several months later. We also have to be careful with people who have received antibody therapy, monoclonal antibody therapy. Uh, because that could interfere with the immune response. Uh, otherwise, uh, pretty much anyone can get vaccinated uh, when the vaccine's available to them. Okay, thank you. Avery, WCAS. Governor, we ran a story the other morning talking with some stores who said they were having a hard time keeping Christmas lights on the shelves or wondering to get your reaction to that, whether you think you can take any credit for the Life Away campaign causing that, or whether it's maybe just general holiday well, purchases. Yeah, I, I can't take credit for it because I didn't buy them all, but uh, certainly Vermonters uh, stepped up in all kinds of ways. I think it's the mood um, that people want to uh, show that uh, there is some bright spots here and that we're all in this together, and, and they reacted accordingly. I, there were a number of communities that were planning uh, this type of thing before I, uh, I mentioned it, uh, our initiative. But, um, but it's been really, um, I think, helpful uh, in many respects as we, we see uh, many of these communities, individuals and so forth, uh, trying to just bring just a little bit of happiness into to someone's life. And sometimes all, the, all that is is just uh, decorate, uh, a decoration of their home or their facility. Uh, and, uh, and other organizations, as we saw the other day, the uh, National Guard coming from St. Albans uh, down uh, here into Washington County, uh, I think uh, drew a lot of attention and I know it was appreciated by many. So we've seen many instances like that, uh, that, uh, that but, uh, but uh, it's not my, it's not my uh, credit from, for me, it's credit to Vermont uh, for doing what we can to help others. Thank you. Hi. Um, Rebecca and Ethan, this is Tom Ayers from the Standard. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, sorry, I was having some issues with my phone a few moments ago. Uh, I had a follow-up question um, regarding uh, the rollout of the vaccine to skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities. I'm not clear who uh, will actually be administering the vaccine uh, at those facilities. Will it be uh, local hospital personnel, will it be the staff of the facilities themselves, or it will, be will it be representative of the pharmacies th that are I, providing it? I believe it's the pharmacies, but I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. <clears throat> yeah, it's primarily the pharmacies themselves. I believe that uh, that's, 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 there's, there, there may be times that uh, personnel from one of our local health offices might be uh, and as listed or in aid or what have you, but the primary uh, vaccinators are the pharmacies. And that's part of their contract. And do you anticipate, given the relative uh, ease of storing uh, the Moderna vaccine versus the Pfizer vaccine, do you anticipate that most of the skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities will uh, utilize the Moderna vaccine? Actually, it's the contrary. They're, they're all being given the Pfizer vaccine because they've all demonstrated they have the ability to store it appropriately. And because these clinics are all pre-scheduled at each facility, they know exactly what day they're going to what facility and the approximate number of doses they need to have. So they have preferentially gotten the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and that was actually um, something that most, I, sh I should say all, of the New England states agreed on together uh, as a strategy, uh, and it simplified the process a bit as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and, and happy holidays to all of you. Thank you, Tom. 
All right, we're through our first round, and I believe we have one follow-up question from Mike Donahue. Actually, I just left. Governor, I appreciate your comment about the, the light, uh, you not being uh, the primary source for it, but much like what you said at Thanksgiving time, I know you like to pass the, hear the, hear the response and that it's all part of your team, but uh, the reality is that somebody's got to drive the bus and you're driving the bus on this thing. And like I said at Thanksgiving time, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, you know, you are the Thing. Yes, you've got great people around you. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks very much. As, as you might, uh, uh, might know, I do like to drive, uh, so driving the bus is uh, <laughs> fine with me. Um, but uh, as I learned, you know, my years of racing, all the success that I had, uh, again, I, I got all the accolades uh, for winning a race, but the, the real reason I won is because of the team, you know, putting together a good car, having all all the ingredients uh, to, to getting that win. So it's not all the driver, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the team behind it and the equipment you have. So I'm, uh, again, blessed uh, to be surrounded by really, really talented people and uh, talented Vermonters as well, willing to, to do whatever is necessary to help their neighbors. And uh, the story that I told during my remarks about the one neighbor seeing another uh, coming home with five gallons of fuel to get through the day or the next couple of days uh, and them uh, purchasing 100 gallons of fuel for them anonymously, I think speaks volumes about who we are as Vermonters and, and that inspires me, inspires I'm sure each and every one of you to do what you can to help one another, regardless of whether you agree with them or even like them, uh, you, uh, you tend to, to help them out. Thank you. That's it. Well, again, record time, um, but uh, I thank you all very much for tuning in. And again, I wish you a very, very peaceful, safe, and small uh, celebration uh, for those who celebrate uh, Christmas uh, in the next uh, couple of days. So, but we'll see you back on Tuesday. Hopefully, we'll have more information for you, and uh, we'll have the modeling as well. But, uh, but again, thank you very much for tuning in.